This episode is about so-called augmented reality guns. The term is usually abbreviated to AR guns. I will tell the story, introduce some guns and then I will show some games. Most AR guns are controllers which hold cellular phones. Usually the guns just send button inputs to the phone and use the phone's built-in sensors for further functionality. Information from the camera feed, gyro sensor or accelerometer and sometimes a combination thereof is used to navigate the view inside a video game. The player pays attention to the phone screen while playing. As the name already suggests, the camera feed is often integrated into the game. Personally, I would say there were two AR gun periods. A first one in which AR guns didn't really succeed and vanished again and then the second period in which AR guns had a breakthrough and got more commonly known. The earliest AR gun I was able to find was the App Blaster made by App Toys in 2011. Later they came together with Spin Master which then also distributed the App Blaster and eventually designed a second more pistol like version of it. Much like many Nintendo Wii Cradles, the App Blaster was a mechanical design in which the trigger operated a plastic arm which would press onto the screen in order to shoot. Because of the shape of the phone holder, these controllers were just usable with a few specific phones. The next evolutionary step were two wired AR gun designs which connected to the phone via the TRRS socket. Both were first revealed in early 2012. The lead commander, Barawi, was revealed one month before the Xepo by Metal Compass. Metal Compass, however, filed a patent for wired AR controllers already in 2010. Of these four early AR guns, the Xepo found the most support within the community and various companies released compatible games. The history of the second wave of AR guns begins almost as early as the first wave did. The guns of the second wave however took a long time until they finally hit the market. In 2012 this independent store took place in China which had banned video game consoles and restricted arcades in the year 2000 by law. This ban had a heavy impact to the local gaming landscape and shifted it towards PCs and mobile devices. Game designer Bruce Cowell filed a patent for an AR gun and built first prototypes. He claims that he already came up with a general idea one year prior. In 2013 he uploaded an introduction video to YouTube in which he showed a non-functional design prototype. The device, as he envisioned it, already sported a joystick. Besides the obvious gun functionality, Bruce also wanted the device to be a selfie stick, a remote, a phone holder which is able to reject or answer calls and a PC compatible controller. A few days later, Bruce uploaded a second video in which he showed a working prototype which didn't yet have all the features and the desired form factor but was already able to wirelessly control the phone it was holding. In the upcoming months, Bruce was playing with new design ideas such as an additional internal camera, force feedback and the ability to use the controller as a battery bank. Later the same year, Bruce showed a rifle-shaped prototype which almost looked like a commercial product already. Around that time, Bruce has attracted enough interest to team up with others and started a company. The team raised money on crowdfunding websites and also attempted to kickstart the campaigns. The rifle model got its final design in 2014 and was called PP Gun. In 2015 the pistol design was finalized and the product was called PP Gun Mini. Later in the life cycle, for both PP Guns, HTC Vive, VR compatible versions were made. The PP Gun controllers weren't successful in the western world. Not many people were prepared to pay much money for a mobile device's gun controller, no matter how high the quality of the item was. Possibly influenced by the local game console ban, AR guns were much better received in China than the first wave of AR guns in the western world three years prior. Soon the Chinese market was flooded with cheaper guns which had a vastly cut down functionality. The rich product diversity and the low price allowed AR guns then to find more acceptance in the western world. 
Most of these cheap AR guns don't do much more than holding a phone while wirelessly sending button inputs into dedicated software. The majority of the available guns doesn't pair with phones as proper Bluetooth controller, and thus they are locked down to a single app. Vice versa, many AR gun apps need to be paired with a specific gun controller in order to work. In this section I am going to introduce some AR guns I own and then I will continue to speak about some other noteworthy designs. The App Blaster originally retailed for 70 US dollars. It is very solid and sturdy. The two triggers are reinforced with metal plates. The paint job is very clean. The rifle stock can be removed to turn this controller into a pistol. The design was made for the hands of children and thus the gun isn't pleasant to hold with huge hands. The removable gun cradle is able to host the Apple iPhones 3GS and 4, the 4th generation iPod Touch and devices with a similar form factor. Personally, I like the original App Blaster, but in my opinion, the limited compatibility degrades it to just being a novelty. Today, with a highly reduced relative market share of Apple phones, such a toy would be unthinkable. The second version of the App Blaster was designed by Komi Creations. Their initial design sketch with the analog joystick makes me question though whether the designers understood what the App Blaster is. The controller is still very sturdy, but the paint job is sloppy this time. A great new feature is that the formerly linear trigger is now tactile. The controller is quite ergonomic and is pleasant to hold for most hand sizes. The actuating arms are protected in an enclosure this time, which simplifies storage and transport. The phone cradle is held firmly in place and is more compatible than before. The controller is still shipped with an adapter for the iPhone 4 and 4S, as well as iPod Touch 4, but includes also sheets of foam to make custom adapters for a wide range of mobile devices. In my opinion, this second version of the App Blaster is a great improvement and I like it. The Xapper retailed for 30 US dollars. It looks a lot like a space gun. The stickers on the sides don't look very nice, as they don't stick very well and come loose. The overall build quality is good and the gun feels dirty. From the right hand side, the speaker, which outputs the phone's audio, is well visible. On the top, the cable is clipped in place between plastic notches. The trigger is based on a very tactile push button and feels great. The unit is powered by three AAA cells, which are located in the handle of the gun. The Xappa has a unique screw-based mechanism to hold the phone. Sadly, it doesn't extend far enough to house modern white phones. The phone is secured by turning the top orange knob, which moves the screw in the top half of the mechanism. Inside the pole on the gun is the corresponding thread. Maybe the Xappa needs a companion app to work? or the Android event was remapped, as it is often the case for mobile headsets with additional controls. Maybe it's a CTIA or RMTP pin identity problem. Either way, I wasn't able to use the gun on Android 9. The Elite Commander pistol was priced at 25 US dollars. Similar to the Xapper, it also sports a built-in speaker and relies on a TRRS cable to connect with the phone. The phone mount is removable, allowing this controller to be used as toy gun by children. For this purpose, there is a mode in which pressing the buttons of the gun emits sounds. The gun recognizes if a phone is attached and then changes to mobile phone game mode. The controller is very solid and feels dirty, but overall looks cheap because of the large stickers on the side plates. The row of buttons just below the on-off switch is very mushy and the buttons are difficult to press. The trigger relies on a rubber dome and feels rather strange. The phone holder makes use of dented rails under spring tension. That way the phone is held securely and can be released with the push of a button. The TRRS cable is contained in a small compartment in the front, which can be assessed from both sides. The unit is powered by two AA cells. 
Sadly, I wasn't able to actually test this controller, as the only supported app Elite Commander Last Hope is not compatible with Android 9 and crashes. The PP Gun Mini was offered for 99 US dollars by Shenzhen Zimeng Technology. It came in a very nice looking carrying case, folded into its selfie stick configuration. In my opinion, this looks a bit like a dagger. I am sure using it folded in conjunction with the Planet Gyro add-on module on computers to play sword games would have been fun. The hammer acts as lock button to switch between the configurations. Below it is the shutter button for the camera. The gun is very compact in comparison with most other guns shown in this episode. The controller comes with three different sized battery lids, which double as spacer for the handle. That way, it is pleasant to hold for most hand sizes. I like the placement of the buttons a lot. The buttons themselves are responsive and well made. At the left front is a little joystick. On the opposite side is a D-pad and a cluster of buttons. The highlight of the PP Gun Mini is its microswitch based trigger. It is tactile, very clicky and I love the feeling. The orange tip protects an USB output. As I understand it, further add-ons were supposed to be connected that way. As it is, this port can be used to charge devices. The gun itself runs of a removable 18650 cell, which can either be charged via an USB micro B socket on the gun itself or via a stand. The translucent plastic at this light acts as power and mode indicator. Different modes are selected upon booting up by pressing a certain button while flipping the power switch. This switch has three positions as it also controls the force feedback. Upon pressing the trigger, the slide rapidly rattles fore and back even for one single shot. First, I was irritated by this, but if this controller isn't considered a simulation gun, but a fun futuristic fantasy weapon, it isn't bad at all. Personally, I like this kind of force feedback much better than the dull rumble feedback of the Desert Wolf or the PG-9082. At the top and the bottom of the gun are Picatinny compatible rails. The various attachments are put onto these. The most important attachment is the angle adjustable phone holder. As it relies on two padded poles rather than a larger contact surface, it is quite forgiving towards phone buttons located on the top facing side. An extension rail allows mounting items nearer to the player, higher or further away. It gives great control over the center of mass. An optional hand grip also provides the gun with a trigger guard. Another kind of hand grip is very useful for games which rely on the joystick and or the buttons on the right hand side. This grip is also included to facilitate another use case of the PP Gun Mini, a standard gaming controller. For these scenarios, the grip is either attached below the joystick or the D-pad. Nobody claims that this was the best way to play games, but as the compatibility is very high, because the controller pairs with computers and mobile devices in a standard way, and as for the high quality of the buttons, this is a nice backup for moments without dedicated controllers within reach. The PP Gun Mini didn't come with dedicated games. Instead, the manufacturer suggested some gyro compatible games, which are fun to play with the gun. In conjunction with Octopus as companion app, a large variety of games can be enjoyed with this controller. The simply named AR gun is with a retail price of 11 US dollars a representative for the more affordable portion of the spectrum. The build quality is great and the gun feels very sturdy. For right-handed players, the button layout is very useful. All buttons and the analog stick register inputs well. The gun has a great feeling microswitch based trigger. The unit is powered by two AA cells which are located in a cute little ejectable magazine. The phone holder snaps into place but sadly doesn't stay there very well. If a heavy phone is used and the player aims up viciously, the holder may snap down sometimes. Sadly, this controller doesn't connect to phones or computers as a generic parable Bluetooth controller and thus is locked down to the Lens app it came with. I think this is a shame and I would otherwise strongly recommend this controller. 
I bought the Arm School Victory King, which was made by Homkey, just for its high quality Picatinny rail compatible phone holder. Usually these guns can be bought for around 10 US dollars. To my great surprise, I have found the controller itself to be very decent. The gun design reminds me a lot of a pistol in the movie The Fifth Element. The knob on the back could indicate that at some stage an optional rifle stock was planned. The overall build quality of it is decent, but the gun is a bit rattly. Ergonomically, the gun was made for right-handed people with small hands. It is powered by two AA cells located in the front of the gun. The trigger is tactile and clicky, but sadly it binds and is scratchy. The buttons don't rely on rubber domes, but directly actuate push buttons, which makes them feel stiff. At least they are very tactile. The analog stick also serves as power indicator and glows blue if the gun is turned on. The Victory King came with two objects which act as reference points in some of the AR games. Speaking of the latter, the games for the pistol are much better made than the comparable Lancer games, but sadly I faced limited compatibility. Apparently not all games are compatible with my revision of the gun. The Victory King readily paired with my phone and my computer, but sadly I wasn't able to use it outside the dedicated app on the phone and not at all on the PC. iPicker is a quite famous manufacturer of smartphone accessories and gaming controllers. It offers two AR pistols and an AR rifle. Of these I own the PG9082, which is the most simple of these units and was released in 2015. It was situated in the middle price range and was offered for approximately 40 US dollars. It offers an optional rumble force feedback, which is fast but very weak. The controller is powered by a built-in rechargeable battery, which is the gun's biggest drawback as for the negligent implementation. The battery will arrive in a pity condition out of the box and will never be able to fully charge. The phone holder does a good job and folds firmly into place. Most buttons are located under the well-built analog stick. Personally, I think this is not very useful as for the limited accessibility. There is another button at the handle which is better placed, but in my opinion it actuates too easily. This button and the trigger feel almost like the left or right button on a mouse and probably rely on a miniature microswitch of some sort. The buttons on the left hand side are fake and don't do anything, which is frustrating as this location would have been more accessible than the actually used one. Although the grip sports rubberized sections, the gun isn't pleasant to hold. The overall shape makes for a non-ergonomic experience and the battery in the front puts the center of mass to an awkward position. The very noticeable orange tip on the gun reminds me a lot of the PP Gun Mini and possibly it could be a nod to it. Sadly, this controller doesn't pair as generic Bluetooth controller neither. Quite surprisingly, the iPicker PG9082 seems to have been rather successful as it was copied at least twice. This is although iPicker filed a design patent in China. These copies are among the widest spread AR guns in the West. The controller I am showing in this video is the simpler variant. There was a very similar gun which also copied the analog stick and the diamond cluster of four buttons underneath. The similarities to the iPicker PG9082 are striking. Interestingly, the barrel piece is now even more reminiscent to the PP Gun Mini's USB socket as for the triangular shape. This controller is powered by two AAA cells which are put into a compartment in the gun's handle. Therefore, this copy doesn't share the PG9082's charging problem and the center of mass is not too far in the front. Sadly, the only two buttons of the gun are still located below the hammer. This gun makes up for it though by offering a way better trigger. It is very tactile and clicky. The phone holder snaps firmly in place. The price of this device depends very much on the software it ships with. The cheapest variants come with the Lancer app. These are typically offered around 12 US dollars. As it was with the original, this controller doesn't pair as generic Bluetooth controller neither. 
Personally, I own the Blaster Pro branded version, which causes issues in the app of the same name, which really is a shame, considering it is soft docked to it. The Desert Wolf, which was made by Lovin Global under the X Rover brand in 2016, is among the most expensive controllers in this video. It is usually offered for approximately 120 US dollars. Lovin Global is notable for continuing to offer the Delta 6 motion controller, of which I have previously talked about in episode 109. I will just show the Desert Wolf briefly in this episode, as I am going to make a dedicated video for it. Besides mobile devices, the Desert Wolf also supports PC, PlayStation 3 and 4, Xbox 360 and 1, Nintendo Switch and the HTC Vive. What differentiates it from the competition apart from this very high compatibility is the built-in gyroscope. Thus, not just gyro-compatible mobile games can be played with this controller, but also the rest. An additional app called Octopus can be installed, which maps the gyroscope output of the controller to touch gestures. Octopus is far from great and has many annoying flaws, but overall it's nice that it opens up the game library a lot. The build quality of the Desert Wolf is great. The controller ships with a removable handle which relocates the analog stick. The phone holder is removable and doubles as a wife tracker holder. It can be firmly put into any desired angle. The buttons feel great and are distributed to very useful locations. One button is solely mapped as a cutoff for the gyro functionality, which is very useful. The side picture is nice and clear. The Desert Wolf is powered by an internal battery, which is charged via a USB-C socket near the trigger guard. Sadly, this gun isn't flawless. The trigger feels very unsatisfying and is devoid of any tactility. More alarming, apparently the trigger isn't very sturdy. While making this video, the trigger mechanism in my unit broke, which made me open the gun. Inside, I saw why the trigger is feeling so linear. Instead of using a proper switch, the trigger just moves a spring between two conductive poles. At a certain angle, it interconnects the two poles, which corresponds to a press trigger. This spring was the part which failed on me. I exchanged it for a full-size microswitch and now I am very happy with this controller. While looking into the gun, I was pleased to see that the PCB is well designed and assembled tidily. I am unaware of any dedicated mobile apps for the Desert Wolf and therefore I think the player has to use Octopus for normal AR games too, in order to map the trigger to an on-screen finger press. I like the Desert Wolf much. But at its given price, I wouldn't recommend it unless the player uses the gun on all supported systems and knows about the severe limitations of gyro guns. Takara Tommy made a very unusual AR gun, as it is fully self contained and doesn't depend on hosting a mobile device. It's called Monster Shooting Reel. As I will introduce it in a more in depth dedicated episode, I won't continue to talk about it here. I am ending the gun segment of this video by quickly presenting some guns which I don't own, but deem interesting. Hasbro bought the rights for laser tag from Tiger Electronics and then later merged it with their Nerf line. Under the Laser Ops Pro lineup, the so called Alpha Point was released, which is both a laser tag gun and an AR gun. Sadly, as a laser tag gun, the Alpha Point seems to be vastly inferior to previous products. Speaking of Nerf guns, the mini variant of a spiritual successor of the PP Gun Mini can shoot foam darts too. The spiritual heritage of the gun is even more noticeable when looking at the full size variant, which is HTC Vive compatible. These guns are called QD Gun, which is visually rather close to PP Gun. There is another AR gun which is heavily influenced by the PP Gun Mini. It is called 2-in-1 and was distributed by Bakey. It can be folded into a selfie stick just like the original, but furthermore can be extended telescopically. There is at least one other AR gun which can be folded into a selfie stick. It is called Poseidon. This controller further differentiates itself by consisting of two parts. 
The front portion can be removed which yields in a considerably shorter pistol. Many air guns were copies of real world firearms. Severe tensions between people of Hong Kong and the Chinese government escalating in 2019 led to heavy restrictions toward trade and export of gun-shaped objects. This strongly affected game controllers and toys in general. From this time on, air guns which didn't look like firearms or ones which were obviously made from plywood become very widespread. The latter development is somewhat ironic considering that these guns are again close to Bruce Gao's earliest design prototype. In this third and last segment I am discussing AR gun apps. I don't own an iOS device and thus this segment focuses on Android applications. Many of the shown games have iOS versions though, which are supposedly very similar. As you might be aware, there is plenty of harmful software in the Google Play Store. Check what kind of permissions a given app needs and read reviews. Each time an app asks for permissions, question yourself whether this particular permission is something you want to grant. Many games I read about during this review aren't available in the Play Store anymore. Technically, they can be downloaded elsewhere and can then be sideloaded. Do not sideload programs from sources you don't fully trust. The earliest AR gun game I am aware of is Alien Attack. It is a wave-based shooter in which different kinds of aliens fly by and attack the player when they come close enough. The second trigger on the app blaster shoots grenades which cause damage in a large area. The gun is reloaded by backwards tilt motion. Alternative weapons are picked up throughout the game and can be equipped by tilting the gun sideways. Pickups, which for example replenish health or the stock of grenades, appear from time to time. Instead of the camera feed, the player can choose to have a space-themed backdrop. Personally, I enjoy this game and I would recommend it. As a representative game for the wired controller era of AR guns, I would like to introduce Balloon Gunner 3D, as it was one of the earlier titles and was available on both Android and iOS. In it, the player steers a balloon and fights hostile balloons, ships and other objects in 40 levels. Personally, I think this game controls too twitchy and I didn't enjoy it much. As of making this video, the most common AR gun app is simply called AR Gun and was made by Lense. It is a confusing launcher which contains 21 individual games. Some of these games are unplayable and others are clearly not finished or broken. As such, this app reminds me a lot of the NES and Mega Drive versions of Action 52. Many games are clearly just basic Unity library asset flips or stolen or hacked content. As the app is free and as some of the games can be played with a generic gun using Octopus, I don't want to be too harsh and will mostly show the highlights of the app. On the AR side of things, there is a game where the player shoots spaceships in multiple levels. One in which birds are hunted. A game in which floating fruit are sliced. And finally one in which sea creatures are killed. Generally the non-AR games in this package are a bit better. There is a whack-a-mole game which personally I like the best. In one game ships try to crash into the player. Then there is a tank game which makes great use of the analog stick. Also included is a bad hack of Hammer 2, in which bullet time can't be engaged and the grenades can't be thrown. Still, I liked playing Hammer 2 with an AR gun. The game which was made for the Nerf Laser Ops Pro Alpha Point can be downloaded free of charge and can be played with generic pairing AR guns using Octopus. In the game waves of drones attack the player. Depending on the color, they withstand more shots. From time to time a special shot pickup appears. The game gets progressively more difficult. The background can be switched between AR and computer generated graphics. Among the non-item assisted games in this video, this app is by far my favorite. 
it plays very well and looks pretty. Raptor Hunter AR is a very basic game. The player is attacked by a continuous stream of raptors from multiple directions. Killing raptors grants the player with in-game money which can be used to unlock new weapons. Personally I wouldn't describe this game as great, but as it is free and supports generic pairing AR guns I think it is worth a look. Attack of the Blocks is very similar to Raptor Hunter AR. It offers four different scenarios, one of which is augmented reality. I don't think the game is better than Raptor Hunter AR, but I thought it was worth mentioning, as it is also free. A severe problem of all gyro-based games is the drift of the reference position. There is a multitude of games which use a real-world item as a positional reference. The game constantly makes corrections based on the camera feed in relation to the item. There are a few games which use a poster as reference. A noteworthy example is the Blaster Pro app, as it is free and works with generic pairing guns using Octopus. If the game is downloaded, the player can print out or display the posters on a screen. I bought the posters physically. They are very sturdy as they were printed onto plasticized paper. The graphics of the five included games are very nice. In all of these games, the poster is shot down, which reveals a game underneath. In one game, birds are shot. In another game, the player is attacked by zombies. There is a very nice on-rails shooter, which takes place in the desert. An aliens themed game plays a lot like Galaga. A pirate game takes place on a little globe. In it the player defends a house on an island. Personally I enjoy the games very much, but I have to mention very clearly that the gun which ships with the posters causes the software to run unstable. Therefore I cannot recommend buying the physical Blaster Pro package. There is an app which is very similar to Blaster Pro, but far worse. It was made by Lenze. It is called AR Rolls and consists of three games and an interactive zoo. None of these games draws a backdrop behind the frame. Like some of the Lenze games in AR Gun, this wall collection feels incomplete and broken. I can't recommend this app even though it is free. The Indian developer SRG United Solutions released two games that need the player to place a sheet of paper onto a table. The game then creates an AR world on top of that paper. In Aliens on the Table, aliens must be eliminated while dodging their shots. Three levels consist of five waves each. A wide arsenal of weapons is available. The ammunition of each weapon is limited, but the supply restocks after some time. Table Zombies is conceptually a very similar game, but it plays much worse. Sadly, it runs rather unstable on Android 9. The player has to protect soldiers from waves of zombies and monsters. To me, the game looks far less appealing, as it solely uses Unity stock assets. My favorite item assisted AR game is Kazulu Vortex, from the Kazulu series made by Unlimited Reality. The game uses a big cardboard circle, which is a bit larger than a LP record. During Kazulu's heydays, also smaller discs were sold, and instead of just one fantasy-themed game, there were three. Bundles with both kinds of App Blaster were offered, but usually the games were sold without mentioning compatible gun controllers, as these apps are also fun on their own. Vortex has three game modes, Classic, Arcade and Crazy. In Classic there are five scenarios which consist of five levels each. Upon clearing a level the performance is rated with stars, which increases the replay value. Secondary weapons can be unlocked for this game mode. In Arcade mode the player tries to keep monsters from reaching a central platform. This task gets progressively more difficult over time. In Crazy, the player tries to stay alive as long as possible, while dragons creep out of a hole in the floor and attack the player. Of the Kazulu series, I also own DMX, which is a science fiction themed sequel. 
The game also consists of 25 levels in the main mode, but offers for each level 3 degrees of difficulty, which are rated independently. There is again a survival mode, but this time it's the goal to reach the highest possible wave. Instead of an arcade mode, there is a non-AR minigame in which the phone has to be tilted. DMX isn't bad by any means, but in my opinion it is less well designed than Vortex and simply not as much fun. I enjoyed the few games which were compatible to my home key gun. There is an AR version of Duck Hunt, which copied the likeness of the original Nintendo sprites. In Spider Area, a vast array of weapons is available to defeat spiders in 8 levels. The levels are freely selectable and get progressively more challenging. Rolled Inside is an item assisted wave shooter. The variety of enemy models is high and thanks to the reference point for the phone camera, the game controls fine. According to Bruce Cow, the PP gun controllers were meant to play more complex gyro controlled games as serious controllers. Bruce himself isn't very fond of AR games. As an example of what kind of games are recommended by Shenzhen Zimeng Technology, I show Modern Combat 5 by Gameloft. In complexity, this game is more akin to PC and console games. This story-driven game has full cutscenes, skill trees and a wide range of sceneries. The gyro controls work fine and the game is a lot of fun that way. I am closing the software segment with an example of a non-gyro compatible app that can be played as a gyro game using a controller with an independent gyro sensor and the app Octopus, which maps the gyro information to on-screen swipes. Basically, all games which allow navigation through on-screen swipes and offer adjustable sensitivity settings thereof in the options are potentially compatible. I played the walking zombie using the desert wolf gun and I liked the experience. In comparison with real gyro supporting games, the controls are even more granular and more difficult to use. As with all gyro games, the zero position will drift during gameplay. The Rocking Zombie is a nice story driven game, but nags the player with advertisements and tries to sell in game content. The game simply uses Minecraft like looking Unity stock assets. Nevertheless, the graphics appeal to me. The PP gun and its pistol counterpart weren't the first ever air guns, nor were they able to generate a large revenue. Nevertheless, they undeniably heavily influenced a role genre of gaming. This can be proven by looking at no fewer than 8 other AR guns, which took traits of the PP gun mini design. Ultimately, the market was flooded with too many too similar controllers with lackluster software support and the bubble did burst. But even as of making this video in 2020, after a period of stagnation, AR guns is still a thing. Most notably, recently YouTuber PewDiePie started to heavily endorse the upcoming Arcade Blaster. To me, AR guns was an interesting journey and I am very glad I took a dive into it. This is the end of the review. My name is Ben. I thank you for viewing.